Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who celebrates Groundhog Day privately. Here is the captain. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very excited to be featuring Cali Gold by the brilliant brewers over at Seventh Sun Brewing Company. Cali Gold is a West Coast Pilsner that's aggressively hopped with a blend of citrusy West Coast hops. ABV 5%, garage grade four and a half, bottle caps out of five. And let's give some praise and thanks to our good friends who helped us fill up the fridge for this week. First up, a big shout out to Audrey and the wonderful staff and brew team at 7th Sun Brewing in Columbus, Ohio. And a big We Like Your Jib to Chrissy in Hastings, Michigan. And last but certainly not least, we have Evan at the Thirsty Scholar at the Ohio State campus. Everyone we just mentioned contributed to this week's beer run. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, B-W-E-R-U-N, beer run. If you're not following us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, do so at True Crime Garage. Not only do we do case updates sometimes there or stuff that's happening in the true crime news, and we also share pictures and details of the cases that we're covering each week. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. No one expects a dear friend or loved one to vanish from their lives mysteriously and without explanation. Along with the grief and pain, there is always so much confusion around a missing person's case. The loss of a loved one is an incredible loss, but not knowing what happened to them or where they could be is beyond mentally taxing and emotionally it's torture. February 3rd, 2023 is National Missing Persons Day. According to HolidaysCalendar.com, Missing Persons Day is a holiday that's observed annually on the third day of February. This day is designed to highlight the fact that over 1,500 people go missing every year in the U.S. National Missing Persons Day was created by Joanne Lowitzer after her daughter Alexandria went missing in 2010. She wanted to create a day that brought the public's attention to the problem of missing persons every year. Alexandria Joy Lowitzer was last seen in her hometown of Spring, Texas on April 26, 2010. Her family calls her Allie. In 2010, she was 16 years of age. Allie left school that day and got off at her usual bus stop near her home at 3 p.m. En route, she called her mother, saying she was going to walk to Burger Barn, where she worked, to pick up her paycheck. This was only a quarter of a mile from her home. She never arrived at the Burger Barn. 
Allie never came home, and she has never been heard from again. Her cell phone has not been used since she vanished. Alexandria's case was originally classified as a runaway, but investigators soon started looking at other theories in her disappearance. I am thankful to Allie's mother, Joanne Lowitzer, for pushing for an annual Missing Persons Day. There are other days similar to this, but this week we recognize this day, National Missing Persons Day, February 3rd, 2023. This day can be and should be observed by everyone. None of us are immune to experiencing loss or being lost ourselves. Children go missing. Both men and women vanish. The elderly, some suffering from forms of dementia, some people with psychiatric problems regularly go missing. And each year, scores of indigenous women go missing. And far too often, their stories are rarely reported. So this year, let's all take a moment and share the story and picture of a missing person. If all of us share information, get the word out about particular missing person cases, then we can help to bring more people home. If we all come together, more people can be found and more cases can be solved. This it's True Crime Garage. Missing people. Missing people throughout the United States. Missing people. Post pictures, track DNA. Missing people. And look for that individual. Missing people. Marvin Alvin Clark. For those of you that follow a lot of missing persons cases out there, you may be familiar with this name, with his name and this case. This is a somewhat well-known case. In fact, some have said this is one of the most famous missing persons cases. A lot of that comes from just how old this case is. When people become fascinated with certain types of true crime cases, they tend to dive deep into those stories. So they are on the internet hunting and trolling for new stories, but also researching the old ones. Well, when you go to research old missing persons cases, Marvin Clark's name is sure to appear on the first page of your internet search. Any type of category of true crime that you are into, many times people dive deep into that category, be it missing persons, serial killers, strange mysterious deaths, and so on. Marvin Clark's name comes up when you search for old missing persons cases. And that's because Marvin Allen Clark disappeared a long time ago. There are some unconfirmed sightings of Marvin after his disappearance. However, it's generally believed that Marvin Clark's last known whereabouts was leaving his home in Tigard, Oregon on October 30th, 1926. Yeah, the year the colonel was born. Now, his timeline, Captain, is a little strange, as you know. And one could easily argue that there are a ton of holes in his timeline. But let's get right to it, shall we? On October 30th, 1926, Marvin Clark left his home. The reports that list his time, or an approximate time, say... He left his home around 1 p.m. that day. Many believe that he was going to visit his daughter. Her name is Sydney McDougal. Sydney worked at and lived at a hotel in Portland, Oregon. Today, this is a 10 to 12 mile trip, depending on the route that you would take. So that would take you about 15, maybe 20 minutes. Back then, look, Almost 100 years ago, I don't know the routes or how long it may take to travel there. We can make the easy assumption, I believe, that it would have taken a considerably longer time to travel to and from Portland to his home in Tigard, Oregon. His daughter, Sydney, was the manager of the Hereford Hotel, which was located at 735 Hoyt Street in northwest Portland. Now, very quickly in this timeline, we will start to run into some 
inconsistencies or discrepancies. The initial report of Marvin's disappearance, which comes to us from a November 6, 1926 news article by the Morning Oregonian, states that Marvin was to travel to Portland via stagecoach. But then we get another report about a week later that states that he had traveled to Portland by bus. So right away, Captain, we start to see one problem with our timeline here, and that is the means of travel. How was he planning to get to and from his destination? We have stagecoach, we have bus, both are mentioned. Yeah, and they never talk much about Marvin visiting his daughter before up in Portland, Oregon, stay weird. But also, I think one of the reasons why this case has stayed in the true crime community and one of the reasons why people continue to look it up is that he went missing during the Halloween weekend. Yes, it's a mysterious case already, but then you double down on that with the Halloween weekend and then add to that that this is an older gentleman. Right. Most reports have him 73 to 76 years of age at the time of his disappearance. So rarely, and I say rarely after today's trailer, people are going to say, Nick, you just contradicted yourself. Rarely do we have reports of older people going missing. Now you will see in a lot of times we have silver alerts where we have persons of an older age, seniors that go missing. And a lot of times they are experiencing some dementia But here, and the reason why I think this is weird is that that's easily explained. When we know that somebody is experiencing dementia, it makes sense that they went missing. They wandered off and now their family, everybody's looking for them. We need to find them as soon as we can. Here, we could have that possibility of dementia, but I'm pointing out his age because a lot of times when we see somebody go missing, it could be for nefarious reasons. It could be that somebody did something to them. It could be that there is foul play suspected. But often when we have a situation where there's the possibility that the individual walked away from their life to start anew, we usually don't see it being somebody of this age. It's usually somebody in their 20s or their 30s, maybe even their 40s. He has a whole life a very long life of 70 plus years with his wife, with his family and his whole world as he knows it and they know it. So unless we're talking about dementia here, it would seem very odd to me to have somebody of this extended age walking away to start anew. Marvin Clark was also a very handsome man and he was very dapper and he was dressed for the occasion. It it just seems like he has all his, faculties. It wasn't like he was disheveled and losing his mind or anything. Well, I can agree with you for the most part, but the reports state that there could be a possibility that that is not quite the situation. And that's what is difficult about looking at his case. As we said, one could argue that there are a ton of holes in this timeline and the thoughts about why, how he went missing. So let's get into that. Right away, we see the trouble with the means of travel, right? Did he go by stagecoach? Did he go by bus? The captain is absolutely correct. Handsome man, very dapper. You can, the, the few pictures of him that I have seen, he's, he's well-dressed. He's a distinguished older gentleman. He is often wearing a suit. In fact, one of the possible sightings, And I want to be clear here because there are some reports that make it sound definitive that he was in fact spotted and seen. Right. I want to be clear here. Speculative. Exactly. Thank you, Captain. So one possible sighting of Marvin Clark after he left his home that day was we have a witness that comes forward saying that he was seen at the terminal on Yamhill Street in downtown Portland dressed in a dark suit and slacks. Okay, that goes along with everything the captain is saying. This is, as far as several reports are concerned, to be the last sighting of him. However, 
I think we really need to hone in on this. And I don't think that we can all conclude that that is a confirmed sighting of our man, Marvin Clark. What I think we have here, Captain, because other reports say that there were no sightings of him or there were possible sightings of Marvin Clark, but they were later disputed and unconfirmed. I think here what we have is somebody trying to help, trying to offer up some kind of solution and point the family and law enforcement in some kind of direction, possibly confirming that he did arrive in Portland. This is somebody that is matching his description or someone that is believed to have been Marvin Clark, not definitively Marvin Clark. Well, and let's take out the whole holiday weekend thing. It was the weekend and Portland would be the biggest destination of all the small towns in that area on the weekend. So I'm guessing that those terminals would be filled with more individuals, which would give us more of a chance to identify the wrong person. Right. And here's the other problem. We talk about means of travel as being a complication and being a debate worthy item here in the timeline, but we also have the purpose of his travel. So the purpose of his travels, it's often stated that he was going to go and visit his daughter. Well, that becomes tricky right away, too, because what we learn of, this is how we discovered that Marvin's missing in the first place. Marvin goes on this trip to Portland, or at least that's what his wife was told. It's been stated that he was going to visit his daughter, and I'm guessing that his intentions were to not just visit, but also to possibly stay the night. And that's right. what some of the reports indicate. However, when his wife, after a few days of not hearing from her husband, she reaches out to the daughter saying, hey, did, did your father, how did the visit go? Did your father leave? Is, do you think he'll be back today or tomorrow? And the daughter, Sydney, she says, I didn't know he was coming to Portland to see me. Right. So right there, and then we have our first problem of the purpose of his travel. So other articles state that he was going to Portland for a doctor's visit. This is really interesting to me, and I've, I've heard the arguments, I've read the arguments, and these are very smart arguments. And we've seen this with other more recent missing persons cases, where you have this discrepancy in the story, and there's a possibility that both are true. Is there a chance here that he was going to the big city of Portland, a neighboring city, and he was going there to visit a doctor, has a doctor's visit, and he says, you know what? What a great idea. I will surprise my lovely, wonderful daughter while I'm there with a while I'm there with a visit from her father. Maybe his intentions were to stay the night at the hotel make his travels a little more pleasant, a little more enjoyable, extend them out a little bit, and then return home. So there's a there's an opportunity here that both are in fact true. Well, I think one of the things that makes it more complicated is it, it's not like he's traveling a large distance. He's traveling a pretty short distance. So look, he goes to the doctor's appointment. He goes to visit his daughter. She doesn't, ha let's say she didn't have time for him, couldn't get him a room at where she's working, no big deal. I'll just hit the bus and go back home, right? So it's it's not unlikely for somebody to make an impromptu visit when it's such a short distance of travel. Right, and here's the thing too, though, that I, I have a bit of an issue with both of these ideas for his purpose of travel. We have... And we know this to be true because we've reviewed the newspaper articles. There are articles that date back to November 6, 1926, that are talking about communities and law enforcement in different jurisdictions actively looking for this elderly man. The problems I have with the timeline and the narrative, or narratives, I think we shall say, is... Some of these things could be easily followed up on, right? So we know the story about the daughter where he may have been going to visit her, or maybe it was a surprise visit. But what we do know with the daughter is that 
A, he never arrives. She never sees her father on his travels. B, she's unaware that he was going to visit her or had any intention at all of visiting, of visiting her. So one part I have with that is it's stated in these reports that if he was visiting his daughter, his intentions would have been to stay the night. Well, there's an occupancy to hotels. There was in 1926. There is today. It seems a little out of character for Marvin to go there with the plan of staying the night, not knowing in advance whether he would have a room or not. So that seems a little weird, but more strange than that, in my opinion, Captain, is this doctor's visit. I don't know how things were back in 1926, but today I have to schedule an appointment with a certain doctor. This to me seems like something that could have been easily followed up on. Why does nobody in the family seem to know who or what doctor he was going to visit if in fact he was going to a doctor? Why is there no follow up on it, who the appointment was made with if he ever arrived at that appointment? Because that that's the problem with Marvin's story, right? We have this unconfirmed sighting of him at the terminal in downtown Portland. So that would be an indication that he made it to Portland. However, if he does not attend a doctor's visit, if he does not, which we know he did not meet up with his daughter, if neither of those things happen, and this sighting is unconfirmed at best, we have nothing to indicate to us or to prove to us that, in fact, he even made it to Portland or was in Portland at any time. Well, and Marvin Clark couldn't use his right arm. He suffered from paralysis, and he also had a limp. So these are two things that would really distinct him from other individuals. But it also makes you wonder, at some point, I'm guessing Marvin had a stroke, and that's why he had trouble, one, walking, and, and two, with the use of his right arm. And so is it possible that when he went to travel, he had a, a stroke and didn't remember who he was or where he was at or where he was going. Yeah. And that's the thing too. It's when we talked about this possible doctor's visit, again, these reports are out in the newspapers and this is a time when everybody's reading the papers. If he did in fact have a, an appointment scheduled with the doctor, even if his family didn't know what doctor it was, why did nobody come forward to say that he had an appointment scheduled? Again, it's it's difficult to look at some of these things because we don't know the exact workings of things in Portland, Oregon in 1926. And like you said, I mean, if he has a doctor's appointment, why, is, why isn't that doctor coming forward and saying, hey, I saw Marvin that day and, and he had the appointment and this is what the appointment was about? Or the reverse. I didn't see him that day, but he was scheduled to come in right, and speak with me. So that's really interesting to me. So I don't want to completely squash the whole doctor's visit idea, but I think we should really underline both things here. When we go, we don't know the means of his travels, but we also don't know the purpose of his travels. Well, the purpose of his travels are very sketchy at best, in my opinion, where we have this doctor's visit that we know nothing about. We have the daughter visit that we, that she knows nothing about. Right. It's very strange. It's a very mysterious and intriguing disappearance case. Now we did state that there were some possible sightings of Marvin that could help. The one that seems to might possibly have the most or carry the most weight is the one that we've already discussed that Marvin was seen at a terminal on this street in downtown Portland dressed in a dark suit and slacks. Some reports even state that that is the last reported sighting of him. Again, I don't think that there's enough information in there to confirm one way or another if that is in fact Marvin. But the other possible sightings of Marvin are even more sketchy than that one. So this is the one that has kind of stood the test of time 
where the others did not. And I think that's because these other ones, and we're only talking about two or three at best. Right. I don't think these other ones carried any weight at all because they are so far less descriptive than this one. Yeah, it seems like a handful of horse shit or big bag of malarkey. What is interesting to me here, Captain, and this is one thing that we talk about in the garage when covering these missing persons cases, are identifiers, right? Things that would separate Marvin Clark or any other missing person from the masses, from the from the from just another face in the crowd. For example, when we discussed Bryceless Pisa, his case, he's still missing, unfortunately. Right. He's got this big, prominent tattoo on his left shoulder, this of a Taurus bullhead. So this is not a typical run-of-the-mill tattoo. You know, it's not the... Uh, it's not the the heart with an arrow through it, or or it's not uh, what's you could get a get the tattoo of the woman back in the day when you flex your your bicep and make her wiggle. It's not one that you would expect to see on every Tom, Dick, and Harry. No, he's got a very interesting, very neat and unique tattoo on his upper left arm. So that is a an identifier for somebody like Bryce Lispisa who is still missing now you mentioned it already here captain with Marvin Clark mm-hmm. we have his ailment right we have that that he is having issues with not being able to properly use his right arm he has some kind of paralysis he also walked with a limp according to many articles This is a distinction that at the time is mentioned time and time again, because police hoped that that would help to elicit sightings of him, that this would help people to go, oh, I remember seeing a man that looked like he was in his late 60s, early 70s, and he he walked with a limp. There are other reports, too, that stated that he needed the use of a cane. So, of course, this would be another great identifier for somebody like Marvin Clark. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Canes in the air if you're singing bass for boys to men. Cheers to you, Colonel. Two canes in the air if you're Forrest Gump. <laughs> magic legs. Ma- magic legs. Well, no, and this, you know, like you said, that identifier is really important because it's a holiday weekend. There's going to be a lot of people traveling. And during the weekend, you would assume that there's a lot more people traveling to the big city. Portland being the biggest city in that small region, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe you do see a guy that you think could be in his 50s, 60s, or 70s, but you go, he didn't walk with a limp, or I talked to him on the train, or I talked to him on the bus, and both of his arms were working just fine. Not only does it help you identify if you saw Marvin, but it could eliminate some eyewitness sightings as well. First, he arm wrestled me with the left arm in one, and then he arm wrestled me with the right and once again beat me again. That's interesting, Captain. And it wasn't lost on me that it was a holiday weekend. You know, it's a it's a bit of a hallmark holiday, in my opinion. But a lot of people love Halloween. I know a lot of people love Halloween. How dare you dismiss Halloween? I enjoy holidays ever. I enjoy it because I love the uh, candy and I love the uh, the the scary sounds uh, soundtracks. But yeah, it sounds like somebody's backpedaling on their Hallmark bicycle. I don't know. I I didn't look up or dig too deeply on to see if there were any festivities going on in Portland. Partly though, I I don't believe that there are you know too many men in their seventies that are living for Halloween. But I could be wrong. Right? Could be I, wrong. I've been wrong once or twice before. Now, what's interesting here too, though, that shows a, a an effort by the family. So the family is is quoted and had clearly spoke to reporters at 
more than one time early on when their father or husband was missing because some of them are quoted and referenced in the newspaper articles from November and December of 1926. His daughter that he may or may not have been going to visit, Sydney McDougall, she offers up a $100 reward for information leading to finding her father, Marvin Clark. And of course, $100 back in 1926 is easily half a billion dollars today. Yeah, if my father went missing today, I'd offer up 100 bucks as well. The, the math is not correct. Do not check into that. On November 9th, the Bellingham Herald. So Bellingham, the, the city of Bellingham is in Washington. So we're not terribly far away from Oregon, but we are now across the state line. The Bellingham Herald reports that Marvin Clark's wife, Mary Clark, she receives, air quotes, a disconnected postcard reportedly written by her husband that was postmarked in Bellingham, Washington. And there were persons that came forward that they stated that they believed that they saw somebody matching Marvin Clark's general description at two hotels in the area. So yeah, two different locations. Correct. And what I believe here, captain, it, this is kind of a, a blanketed statement, but to tear this apart a little bit, this looks to me like we're talking about two different eyewitnesses, one at each of these hotels. Now, the dates on these possible sightings of Marvin Clark are November 2nd and November 3rd. Remember, he was traveling on October 30th. So we're a couple days out. This seems to reason that if it was Marvin Clark that was spotted by one or both of these individuals, I'm guessing it would take a few more days than than it does today for this postcard, if it was in fact from her husband, to travel back to Tigard, Oregon for Mary to receive it. One thing, you know, not only was Mr. Marvin Clark handsome and dapper, as we both agree here in the garage. And I will post his picture to Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook if you're curious of what Marvin Clark looks like. I, I do want to point out something that we haven't brought up yet. Marvin Alvin Clark. It just it doesn't seem like uh, this, the, the Alvin must be like a family name because Marvin Alvin Clark. A little, little strange to me. doesn't roll off the tongue, but I would go with Mac for short uh, right. if, if I would have been Marvin. Mr. Clark was highly educated as well. He attended and graduated from two different universities much earlier in his life. And we underline that, though, to point out that if, in fact, this postcard arrives and it's, air quotes, disconnected. In fact, yeah. I don't like the, the disconnected. I don't um, even know what that means. Statement. Well, I, I, I can go into it here a little bit because okay. there's other reports that I think this describes it better. Badly jumbled postcard mm -hmm. is the other description. And I looked high and then i looked low probably shouldn't look for things under the influence i did not find i wanted to find an image of this postcard online because you know me captain like if so many other note people or out a there, letter if there's a note or a letter i am fully invested in the 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 mystery i wanted to review this postcard and couldn't find it. So if anybody out there, any of our wonderful listeners knows where this can be seen, please email it to us. That'd be awesome. Or hit us up on Twitter at True Crime Garage or at TCGNIC. We point out his education because, look, it, it's, it's 1926. There's a much higher population of people that cannot read or write at that time. That would not be the situation for Marvin Clark. What I think the family's pointing out here is we received this postcard. This is good because it means he made it somewhere and he's still alive when it was sent. However, it's bad because we're reading this disconnected or what I like badly jumbled postcard that came from our father, from our husband. We're concerned too that, that he's 
yes, he, he may be alive and he was able to send this postcard, but the postcard is weird as hell. All right. So if it shows up and it's all doesn't make any sense, how the hell did he address the thing? So it even ends up at the correct address. There are reports that state that it didn't go to his wife, but that it went to either the daughter or one of his sons. Uh, but regardless of who receives the postcard, I believe it was his wife because the most of the reports state that that's who received it. Right. Regardless of who received it, how the hell is his message in the postcard all jumbled and doesn't make sense to anybody, but he accurately gives the address. But on top of all that, I mean, no matter how badly it's jumbled, I would believe his wife, she would be the one that could look at that postcard and say, yeah, this postcard might be quote unquote disconnected or all jumbled up, but that is my husband's handwriting. It might be slop, a little more sloppy than normal, but um, that's definitely his handwriting. So I, I believe that that's a, it's, it's not just a hoax or they didn't just get some random postcard from some random in, individual in Washington. Yes and no. I don't like this postcard. I don't like it at all because the postcard to me is much more nefarious than any of these other parts of his little timeline here. So what you're trying to say is that it's possible that if something nefarious happened to him, that somebody else could have mailed a postcard to the family to throw them off the scent that something bad happened in Portland. Actually, I'm going to go with this two different ways. Okay. Something bad could have happened to him in Portland. Something bad could have happened to him in Bellingham, Washington. Something bad could have happened to him in anywhere. I mean, it's we're almost a hundred years later, and we've we've not answered a lot of the questions that are in this story. We can't state definitively that he made it out of his hometown. Exactly. That's what I'm getting at. This postcard to me just screams of potential foul play. And I want to underline the word potential there, right? We've seen it's not terribly uncommon for someone to try to create an alibi in these types of stories, right? Husband kills wife or husband has somebody kill his wife and purposely calls home a couple times and leaves voicemails for the wife after he knows that she's been taken out. Well, I couldn't have killed her. You heard the voicemails. I was trying to get a hold of her. I had no involvement. I had no knowledge of anything that happened to her. And we've also seen it happen with stranger on stranger crimes. It's not out of the realm of possibility that somebody pulls an ID off of this guy or pulls something out of this guy's pockets that's, and sees an address and decides to send a postcard that with, with a message that makes no sense. Right. The other thing, too, is until we see, till somebody else lays eyes on this postcard, none of the newspaper articles at the time, th this is all, we had a conversation with somebody in the family and they told us they received this postcard. I want somebody else's eyes to have seen this postcard. Did this postcard even exist? Yeah, good point. It, did something happen to him before he even left Tigard, Oregon, as you pointed out, Captain? That's certainly a possibility that we need to discuss. Could have something happened to him in Tigard, Oregon, and he didn't even make it out of there. And I'm not trying to point the finger at the family or anything, but it would not be the first time that somebody creates a situation like this to make it look like this dude left and he was alive and well, but sent this jumbled postcard to us several days later after he left our great little city here. Well, I'm just let's go back to my little hypothetical. My father goes missing, right? I could offer up a million dollars if I know that nobody's going to come forward with correct information to come find him. So just because somebody offers up a reward doesn't mean that they're not somebody that we should look at. Well, and the thing here is look at the story. When you review the story, it's one giant tailspin to me. Family says he left Tigard, Oregon to go to Portland to visit his daughter. Daughter says, I had no idea that he was coming to see me. Oh, he might've been going for a doctor's appointment. We have no doctor to back up that there was ever any appointment made or any visit 
that took place. Right. Postcard comes back saying that he's in Bellingham, Washington. Nobody ever said that he was going to Bellingham, Washington to begin with. It's one giant tailspin. And then some articles go out of their way to state that Marvin did not take a coat with him. Now, this is, to me, an interesting little angle here. Let's circle back to the the, the coat or no coat situation. I want to completely address this postcard. You and the postcard. The problem with the postcard here, Captain. Let's say mm-hmm. that let's say the postcard is 100% factually real and true and they receive some confused misguided misconnected disconnected message from Marvin where where's his body right if if he ends up going into some kind of state of dementia or he ends up having medical or health issues while on his travels he should have been found Unless, unless, I mean, unless he's dropped out in the middle of nowhere or out in the forest somewhere. Well, and we're talking about this case, what, almost a hundred years later. So this is, this is not a case that people in that area wouldn't have heard of. So if some mental institution took him in or some hospital took him in or somebody took him in and said, oh, we found this guy, and he's not able to talk, or he's not able to communicate, but he could obviously write a letter. So he he might have some dementia. He might be going in and out of you know, a conscious state, but you'd think that they would have heard of this in the news and at least been able to say, hey, hey we found a guy, and he might be Marvin, but nobody has come forward. Right, and to me... So if he runs into health problems, if he gets into the state of dementia and gets lost, or let's say out of outside of what we've heard or what we've been told that he was even suicidal, those three possibilities seem very unlikely to me, given that we we've never recovered Marvin Alvin Clark. We've never recovered his body. He was never found anywhere. If if Marvin had been discovered somewhere, if he died on a train or on a bus or in a stagecoach or at some hotel, we wouldn't be talking about this story today. There would be a lot less mystery there. So those three possibilities seem to be much less likely than the two possibilities that I think seem of a higher probability. And I would believe that the higher probability factors point to me that either A, he wanted to go missing, or B, somebody wanted him to go missing. Yeah, it's a tough one because, like we said, he didn't have use of his right arm and he had a limp. And so, to me, that's indication that he had some kind of stroke and it's possible that he had another one and lost the ability to communicate and it's possible that they did find him. There was a, a John Doe that one could make an argument could be Marvin Alvin Clark. Who Who is that? Because I think to me, like the, the coat thing is another factor, another part of the story that might lead one to believe or could be some evidence that maybe he was not thinking clearly when he left. You know, it's October 30th. I don't know what the weather was that day or that week, but it sounds like his intentions were to be gone for a night or a couple of days that time of year. You're probably going to want to take a coat with you. So I think that is an indicator that maybe he wasn't thinking clearly, maybe dementia, maybe health issues. So you have that angle and I, that's why we bring up the coat. But again, if it's, if it's mental, if it's dementia, if it's health issues, any of that, I feel like we're, we are finding him. Okay. So in 1986, there was a John Doe that was discovered, um, in the woods between Tiger and Portland. And there was no identification found on the body, but there was an 1888 Liberty head nickel and a 1919 penny, a pocket watch, leather shoes, and a fraternal order of Eagles pocket knife. And four tokens with the inscription DP were found near the body. A 38 revolver 
and a spent shell were also found near the remains. A pair of wired rim glasses were also discovered, and upon the autopsy of John Doe, the state medical examiner, Dr. Karen Gunson, observed a bullet hole in the man's skull. They ruled the death a suicide, and the estimated age of John Doe was 35 to 55, which would be obviously a lot younger than Marvin. They brought in Clark's granddaughter, Dorothy Willoughby, to try to identify the body, but there was no positive identification made, and Willoughby died in 1991. So again, that John Doe was discovered in 1986. He goes missing in 1926, so that's a, that's you know, I hate to say it, you know, I don't want anybody to lose their lunch, but that's a a pretty decayed body. Yeah. The problem with this John Doe though, is it was determined to not be Marvin Clark and it took years for them to figure that out. The interesting thing here too, was the fraternal order of Eagles pocket knife. I was a little surprised. And of course, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to know everything about my grandparents or frankly, I don't know much. And it's a little disappointing now that I've come to this realization that I know almost nothing about my great grandparents, but the fraternal order of Eagles is, is a club. It's, it's an organization that you have to become a member of. I was a little surprised to see, you know, I wanted to see if anybody would be, yes, he was a member of the Eagles or he, he was not. Um, now you don't have to, I guess there are other means of acquiring such pocket knife without having been in the fraternal order of Eagles, but it wasn't until 2018 that they figure out that that John Doe is not in fact, Marvin Alvin Clark. And that was based off of DNA. Now the university of North Texas have, have been great and been doing gangbusters work on identifying unidentified persons for years. They're probably, if not one of the best in the business of identifying these unidentified persons or unidentified remains. They determined based off of DNA samples that were provided to them from family members of Marvin Clark, that this in fact is not Marvin Clark. So what we end up here with everybody doing all this good work. We have the medical examiner out where the remains were located in Oregon, doing great work and keeping alive this case, Marvin Clark's case. And we have the good people down at the university of North Texas doing wonderful work, all trying to solve this mystery. And then what we end up getting captain is two mysteries. We still don't know who Marvin Alvin Clark, what happened to him. And now we have this situation where we have these unidentified remains that were found in 1986. We don't know. We're not able to give a name to this person that was found. Okay. I'm not, I'm I'm going to sound like Mr. Captain possibilities here, but they're looking for a quote unquote descendant of Marvin Clark. And so then they end up finding what his great, great granddaughter Look, it's possible that, you know, his kids weren't his kids. And I don't mean to like just throw out every possibility in the world, but there, this was a time where if you, if you got married to somebody that already had kids and you were going to just adopt them and, and raise them as your own, that you might just never told them that you're not their father. So I'm just saying it's, Isn't it a possibility that, yes, it doesn't match his great-great-granddaughter's DNA, but it it still could be Clark? Oh, yes. Yeah, that that would be a possibility. I would would need to know more about the... I know that's a little far-fetched. I don't think it's so far-fetched. I think we would need to know more, obviously, about their family tree and about the DNA that was collected by the University of North Texas. It does seem to be a pretty definitive statement that they're giving out, but you've quickly poked some holes in that possibility. So it's an interesting. Well, the thing is, is that you have a missing guy for so many years and then 
what, 60 years later, you find these remains and they're between supposedly where he was coming from and where he's going. And people claim there's multiple people that claim that he's possibly suicidal. And this guy death, you know, this John Doe's death is ruled a suicide. What I can't get over is these, the nickel that they found and the penny that they found 1888 Liberty head nickel and a 1919 penny. It just seems uh, strange. I, I'd like to know also if you have a revolver, I think to find the date of when that revolver was made to me, that would be, wouldn't be that hard to figure out. Right. And if that puts us in the time period of Marvin Clark, then I'd go, we need to, we might need to re-examine this. A little. The other thing that you're going to want to figure out as well is, okay, let's pretend that in the very slight chance you've brought up a scenario where it could be Marvin Clark, the remains that were found. The skeleton has been reported was found in the woods by loggers between Tigard and Portland. What the hell is up with Bellingham, Washington, if this were to be Marvin Clark? Does, I mean, does he go to Bellingham and then try to return to his home? And then instead of going home, he kills himself. It, it seems there seem to be a lot of hurdles to clear to make this to be Marvin Clark. I, I no, no, but like you said, I think you raised some good points on what could make this disconnected quote unquote postcard. It, mm -hmm. It's fishy. It's seems somewhat. Yeah, nefarious. It does. It seems very strange in the, the case, this missing situation to me seems a little shaky. Right. I feel like it's a little shaky and I'm not trying to point the finger at anybody, but when we have so many mysteries inside of the timeline itself, inside of what should be a, such a short timeline, it just, there's something about it that feels very weird. And I get it. It's a hundred years ago. There could have been breadcrumbs that were lost along the way. 100%. Nobody's disputing that there could be blanks that should be, could be easily filled in in the timeline here with Marvin Clark that we just can't do given the time, the passage of time here. Marvin Clark's family continues to seek answers in this case, regardless of what happened to Marvin Clark, his family wants to know what happened to him. And NamUs has been involved in Clark's case. NamUs, for those that are unaware, is a forum for families across generations to know that their loved ones have not been forgotten. The oldest case in NamUs is a gentleman named Elijah Cravens, who has been missing since 1902. Cravens was last known to be riding a horse to the woodsman of the World Fair in Oklahoma. He was never heard from again, although he may not be found. He will always have a resting place in NamUs, where he will be remembered. There is also another case that dates back to 1920. But as far as I could find, Captain, this Marvin Clark disappearance of October 1926 is one of the oldest missing persons cases as far as NamUs and other websites and databases are concerned. Again, his family continues to seek answers for Marvin Clark. What happened to Marvin Alvin Clark? Where is he? February 3rd is National Missing Person Day. One of the things that we can do for the true crime community, and we see it a lot on social media. I know, Colonel, you see it a lot as people continue to share images and descriptions of missing persons, and it really does help. It helps law enforcement, and it helps to try to get some answers for these families. Yes, and we mentioned the name in the trailer. We have Alexandria Joy Lowitzer who has been missing since April 26th of 2010. She was last seen in her hometown of Spring, Texas. 
She goes by the name of Allie. She is a Caucasian female. She was age 16 back in 2010. Her height and weight are five foot two, 140 to 150 pounds back then. Her hair, brown hair, sometimes dyed black, and she has blue eyes. She was last seen wearing dark pants, a hoodie, and a multicolored backpack. And we discussed some of the limited details about her disappearance in the trailer. Her family's still looking for her. There's a chance that she did take off on her own. Her friends were very cooperative or appear to have been cooperative in the early stages of the investigation, but later informed the family that Allie was dating a, an older man at the time that she went missing. This was something that is yet to be determined as fact, but was not mentioned at the time when she went missing. So praise to her mother, Joanne, who pushed for national missing persons day. If anybody has any information at all regarding Alexandria Joy Lowitzer, who is still missing, you can contact the FBI VICAP team at 800-634-4097, or you can reach out to the Sheriff's Department, and that is Timothy.Hayes, H-A-Y-E-S, at Sheriff.H-E tx.net and we will put Allie's missing persons poster on our social media on Twitter. Yeah, so if you want to take a moment on February 3rd, we all have missing person cases that we have looked into and tried to do some armchair detective work ourselves. Post a picture of that missing individual and some information and we'll try to share as many of those as we can hashtag those missing person and maybe we could get that trending in the twitter sphere and just a quick reminder last week we recommended our recommended reading from last week was a book called hope by amanda berry and gina de jesus which goes well with missing persons cases and national missing persons day this is a book of of two individuals that were missing and they returned home this is a book that that gives hope to all of the loved ones of missing individuals out there. You can find that title and many great other titles and recommendations on our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter.